Amen. Thank you, Krista, for that song. And what a challenge. What a message in song. In these days in which we live, when fear would dominate our lives, our world, and uh, when you know the Lord, how can you fear when you know Jesus? Turn with me to the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2. We've been looking at the pastoral epistles. And as we look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is talking about prayer. We looked at last time about Paul's emphasis in prayer in the church and also in our Christian lives. He said, first of all, in other words, prayer should be a priority in every single one of our lives. And he mentions four different ways in which we should pray. And I hope that you'll implement that into your life as he talks about supplications, bringing needs to the Lord. <clears throat> We're needy creatures, aren't we? Oh, uh, we have some. About time the Lord meets one need, I got another one. And something else pops up. But God wants to hear our supplications. He wants to hear our prayers and uh, our, our communing with him. He wants us to pray for others. Even Paul said, brethren, pray for us. And I could say that. Brethren, pray for me. I need your prayers. We need to pray for each other. And he tells us more specifically in just a moment. And then he tells us to pray with thanksgiving uh, as we come to the Lord with our needs and problems. Uh, Lord, we've we got another problem with another need. But now he addresses in particular, as we come to verse 2, praying for authority. So don't divorce verse 1 from verse 2 because uh, they're, they're linked together as I talk to you today about praying for authority. He said we're to pray for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. In other words, Paul said to pray in his day for the king and those in authority, and that truth still holds today, that we need to pray for our president and those in authority. We may not agree with the president, his policies or his agenda, but we are commanded to pray for him. And oftentimes we can see in even American history that our presidents have often been immoral, wrong, or ungodly, could we say. President Kennedy was immoral. As we know, in recent years, we find out some of his affairs and his behavior. We know that President Clinton was immoral. And what is sad, he even still got reelected. After Andrew Jackson's swearing-in ceremony and his address to Congress, the new president returned to the White House to meet a flock of politicians, celebrities, and citizens that all gathered at the White House. The crowd swelled to more than some historians say to 20,000 people. As they gathered at the White House, this boisterous mob, as the story goes, made a scene. Some guests stood on furniture in muddy shoes while others rampaged through the rooms looking for the president, breaking dishes, crystal, and grinding food into the carpet along the way. The White House staff reported the carpet smelled of cheese for months after the party was over. In an attempt to draw party goers out of the building, servants set up wash tubs full of juice and whiskey on the White House lawn. So again, we find in recent days the president, as our president, has taken some unusual first step when it comes to appointees. He has appointed the first transgender cabinet member, the first lesbian White House press secretary. There was a petition circulating at Notre Dame for him not to speak at the graduation ceremony of course, him being Catholic because of his stand on abortion. And all of this was just in the first five months of his presidency. But the Bible says, 
Pray for kings and for those in authority. So my first point is this. We are to pray for authorities. And as we think about this comment and this command that Paul is giving uh, as he writes to Timothy, we asked ourselves, well, who exactly was king during his day? Who was the Caesar during Paul's time as he writes the book of Timothy? And of course, when he comes to the book of 2 Timothy, he has appealed to Caesar and finds himself in prison. But we know during Paul's time that the Pharaoh at that time was Nero. Now Nero's mother was a Agrippina, that her mother was Caligula's sister. He was Augustus' great-great-grandson, Nero was. But as we look at uh, his reign, we see that, uh, of course, there was Caligula, and then Claudius, and then Nero. But Claudius succeeded Caligula as emperor, and Agrippina, Claudius, in AD 49, uh, became his fourth wife. In other words, Nero's mother, because his, Nero's father had died. So uh, Agrippina married uh, Claudius, who was the emperor at that time. Of course, that was uh, his fourth wife. But again, we find that uh, Nero later would become the Caesar. But uh, around uh, 51 AD, when Nero was 14 years of age, uh, we find that things begin to happen in his life. When he turned 16, Nero married Claudius' daughter, in other words, his stepsister, uh, Claudia Octavia. And then Claudius died in AD 54, and historians tell us that he was poisoned by his wife, Nero's mother. Now that's just speculation, but historians tell us uh, that what happened. And of course, at 16, when Nero became Caesar, his mother kind of had a big role in his life and was kind of ruling, she felt like, through a Nero. But uh, he kind of wanted to get away from that so what he did, he planned to have his mother murdered. And he had this real good plan that uh, she would die in a shipwreck. Well, uh, she survived the shipwreck. She swam to shore. So he had her poisoned or killed. Uh, and then his stepbrother, Britannicus, rumored uh, that uh, he was uh, supposed to take the throne. So Nero had him uh, murdered as well. And then uh, his reign continues. Uh, his wife, again, he had her murdered. And then he had another wife that uh, he kicked her to death when she was expecting uh, their child. She later died, and uh, so he kind of regretted that. But, uh, and the story goes, as you know, that the fire broke out in Rome. In July 19th, A.D. 64, the fire started at the slope of the Cir Circus Maximus. Tychicus, the main ancient source for information about the fire, wrote that countless mansions, residences, and temples were destroyed. The fire is reported to have burned for over a week. It destroyed three of the 14 Roman districts and severely damaged seven more. Again, there's some speculation as far as uh, was Nero, uh, did he start it? Uh, we're not really sure to this day, but some say that he did. But again, uh, that wasn't enough. Uh, what he later did, he uh, married uh, one of his slaves, a uh, young man, uh, that he had castrated as one of his slaves, and he wound up married. And during his reign, of course, he, after the fire of Rome, he blamed it on the Christians. 
So he was, began to round up the Christians and begin to burn them uh, on crosses and begin to light up Rome and begin to feed them to lions and the persecution started under Nero. So Paul says to pray for him. You think, was he serious? Was he serious when he said, pray for him? Sure he was. During Paul's first Roman imprisonment, his case might have been heard by court judge, John Phillips says in his commentary on Timothy. But it is possible, even likely, that the Apostle Paul appeared before Nero himself and gave his testimony directly to the emperor. If so, what a scene it must have been. There sat the emperor, Nero, dressed in his royal robes, surrounded by luxury, pomp, and power. There stood the centuries and the senators, there stood Paul alone, dressed in his garb. We can see Nero as he stared scornfully at battered-looking Jew, whose bodily appearance some people described as weak, and his speech they said was contemptible. He appeared, uh, uh, appealed to Caesar, as we know. Did he ever make it to stand before him? We don't know for sure. But we do know that he died under Nero's reign. We do know that Nero's, um, could we say, evil stretched far and wide. Even many believe the apostle Peter died under Nero's reign. But needless to say, he says, pray for these kings. Pray for all that are in authority. And we too, in this day in which we live, we must pray for our president, no matter who he is, no matter what his policies are. It doesn't mean we have to agree with what is going on, but we can pray and must pray. Pray that he would be saved. Pray that he would be filled with wisdom to lead our country. Pray that he would do the right thing. Pray that he would not be deceived. Paul says pray not only for our president but for all that are in authority. Again, Philip said pray. Paul is exhorting us to pray for those who wielded power, for the senators, for soldiers, for the local magistrates. The church had already felt the sting of persecution from Herod Agrippa I. He had murdered James and tried to kill Peter. Paul stood before a criminal high priest, a corrupt Felix, a compromising Festus, a careless Herod Agrippa II. Paul himself had persecuted the church at one time. But someone prayed for him. And no wonder Paul would say, no matter how wicked, no matter how ungodly, no matter how unjust, pray for the leaders and those in authority. Look what happened in my life. I was wicked and ungodly and I stood by as he would give the testimony while even Stephen was stoned to death. I arrested and persecuted the church. I was a wicked, ungodly person in authority. But I came to know Christ. Paul said pray for those in authority and we too must pray. Pray for our governor. Pray that he would, would, would know the Lord. Pray for our senators, that they too would do the right thing. Pray for our mayor, as we uh, wrote him a few weeks ago and said, we're praying for you. Our leaders in the community, our leaders in the church, our leaders in our home. In other words, the Bible tells us, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Oh, listen, there's a lot of things we can't do, but we can all pray. Pray for our leaders and those in authority. But notice, he tells us the purpose of our prayers. Notice the that. The that. It implies in the Greek, in order that. We may lead a quiet, 
and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. In other words, Paul proceeds to tell us that there are four ways in which we are to live underneath the authority that God has placed us under, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Notice what he says, that we may lead. The word lead there is a purpose clause with a present active subjunctive. In other words, this is why we need to lead this kind of life. There are four things that it will lead to. First of all, he says, a quiet. A quiet. Now, what does it mean when he says quiet? It means the word quiet implies a tranquility. Twin tranquility, strong says, arising from without. It's from the absence of outward disturbance. Calmness and serenity in social affairs. In other words, as we see in Acts chapter 12, Things weren't quiet uh, as far as uh, what was going on in the political scene. Herod had arrested James and, and Peter and the church. What did they do? They prayed for them. They prayed for the leaders and they prayed for James and Peter. And often there are unjust things that are taking place. It did in that first century. It did in that first church that they were arrested unjustly so. We know that James was executed and Peter was next. But how important it is. I believe even in, in Paul's day as uh, things got out of hand uh, with the governors and the uh, leaders and the magistrates and even Nero and the evil things that were taking place. But we need to pray. The night that the governor was meeting to contemplate whether to crack down more on churches, more on Christians, more upon our society. We met that night as a deacon board and we were praying. We were asking God to, to do something and that very night uh, God worked uh, in a miraculous way. In other words, this word uh, quiet implies a uh, calmness even though things may be going bad and pressure from the outside that we can pray and approach the Lord. Even here recently, it seemed like in the past few months, things have gotten worse, could I say, from the pressure on the church and on believers from the outside. I have here a letter from a conservative a news uh, article that is sent to our church on a regular basis. And several of these conservative organizations remind me uh, on a regular basis the need to pray. In other words, HB 2789 is a bill that's seeking to pass in the state of Illinois. And here's what it says. In-person instruction at schools. The department shall establish metrics for school districts and public institutions of higher education to use during the public health emergency in determining that the district or institution may safely conduct in-person instruction or if the district or institution must implement remote learning or blended remote learning to keep students and staff safe. As, a, as amended, the bill allows Department of Public Health to set rules to provide an in-person instruction, including personal protection equipment, cleaning and hygiene, social distancing, occupancy, occupancy uh, limits, symptom screening, and on-site location protocols for public and non-public schools. Enforcement of the rules will be the responsibility of the local health departments of public health. HB 9. Birth certificate requires the state register of records to establish a new birth certificate when receiving a signed statement that they have undergone treatment for purpose of gender transition. HB 45 changes all statutory requirements from alderman and alderwoman to alder person and alder persons. 
changes all statutory references from congressman to congressperson. HB 709, well, I won't read that one. HB 1871, vote by mail, expands voting by mail, signed into law by Governor Pritzker. HB 3100, it's an amendment required for all mandated reporters of child abuse to complete a section in training for an explicit bias training. This will require all pastors and teachers to complete the bias training when they come up for retaining for being mandated reporters of child abuse. HB 2590 allows people to get genderless marriage certificates. <clears throat> HB 818, sex education, requires politically correct sex education training for K kindergarten through 12 for all private and parochial schools. SB 1730 requires all public uh, corporations to report self-identified sexual orientation and self-identified gender of its directors Second reading is in the house. In other words, we're having pressure that is coming from without. And how can we maintain a godly life in this world in which we live? Paul says we can be quiet because we're a petition, petitioning a higher power. We're going to God. And we can live a quiet. We don't have to burn down Chillicothe. We don't have to burn down the Capitol. We, we don't have to be irreverent or we don't have to be wrong to do right. But Paul says we can live a quiet and notice he says a peaceable life. A peaceable life. Again, this word peaceable Im implies tranquility arising from within. A self-controlled disposition that restrains from lashing out. He says, for kings and for all that in authority, for all rulers over us, the duty is not dependent on the righteousness of the rulers. The Roman emperors were intensely wicked and ungodly. The Jews were enjoined to pray for their heathen rulers. Listen to what Jeremiah said. In Jeremiah 29 and verse 7. And seek the peace of the city. Whether I have caused you to be carried away captives. And pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. Listen to Ezra chapter 6 and verse 10. that they may offer sacrifices of sweet savors unto the God of heaven and pray for the life of the king and for his sons. In other words, quiet refers to the circumstances around us while peaceful, peaceable refers to a calm attitude within us. In other words, in the midst of a pandemic, we can have a quiet life we can have a peaceful life, and that comes from God Almighty inside. Again, John Phillips said this, when storm tides rise and when the war, world is torn apart by war and woe, when tyrants come to power and people are tormented, peace is still a fruit of the Spirit for the child of God. We can have peace. I'm not talking about outside. We can have peace in our hearts and our lives. And could I say to the church in this day in which we live, things may get worse. But we can still have the peace of God that passes all understanding. We can have the peace of God that Paul talked about riding from his prison cell in Philippians the peace of God that passes all understanding. But notice how else he tells us where to live. In all godliness. Godliness. Now Paul is writing during the time of Nero. Paul is writing under the persecution of Herod. That uh, we see in the book of Acts as we come to that. 
that James is killed and Peter is arrested and the church is being persecuted. But he said, listen, you can still live a godly life in a wicked day. The word godliness means to be devout, to adopt an attitude that is pleasing to God. He says in all godliness and honesty. And our practice of our duties toward God and our duties which we owe to men. I remember Mr. Economides, my Sunday school teacher, for some nine years at Highland Park. I like the way he defined, it, defined godliness like this. He said, godliness is God walking around in your shoes. I thought, how practical is that? Godliness is God walking around in your shoes, on your job, in your community, uh, in, uh, wherever you are. It is God walking around in your shoes. And I think one example of that I always uh, am thankful for is the testimony of Joseph in Genesis chapter 40. You see, Joseph was mistreated by authority. Joseph was thrown in jail unjustly so. But listen to the testimony of Joseph in prison. In Genesis chapter 40 and verse 6. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in ward of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore, look ye so sadly today. In other words, here Joseph is in prison with the baker and the butler. And here Joseph had been mistreated, falsely accused, thrown in prison. He could have been stomping back and forth in that prison. Oh, I've been mistreated. It's been uncalled for. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And, but no, what is he doing? He's having a godly testimony and he's witnessing to these two men and he said, why are you so sadly today? In other words, they could have said to him, how come you're so sad? But he wasn't. What a godly testimony there in that prison. I think about Daniel in the lion's den. I think about uh, the testimony that Daniel had in that day in which he lived. And you and I can have a testimony and God can walk around in our shoes with a godly attitude. Godliness just flowing out of us, a devoutness and a love for Jehovah God. That whether we're in prison, whether we're treated right or unfairly, oh listen, we can appeal to Caesar. That's what Paul did. Maybe he stood before Caesar. Maybe he stood before Nero. Maybe he didn't. We don't know. But notice he says, not only in godliness, but he said in honesty. You see, the word honesty refers to our duties to our fellow man. Some would say that godliness implies God, as we said, living in and through us and our walk with him, that we're, that we're exemplifying Christ. But honesty implies our integrity when it comes to dealing and relating to others. It's no wonder that Paul would tell us uh, in his pastoral epistle to, to Titus when he said that we're to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So again, it implies, uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown said about this word honesty, he said it's a piety, gravity is our propriety or behavior among men. In other words, it's the idea of decency and decorum and respect. John Phillips said this word honesty. He says it implies a perfect gentleman in the best sense of the word. Remember years ago, it could say that a man is as good as his word. You could leave your door unlocked. You didn't need lawyers. You didn't need uh, uh, to fear about uh, so many things that we have now today. Why? Because uh, uh, people don't have integrity. They don't have honesty. And Paul was saying uh, to the Christian, you need integrity and you need honesty. I remember years ago, I went to work for a department store when I was in school. 
And in this department store, we had to watch a video about, uh, you know, the store policies and so forth. And one of the things they showed us about was stealing. Now, it wasn't stealing from shoplifters, because this was a furniture store, uh, necessarily. It was stealing from employees. And it said, and it gave the statistics how uh, the employees were, were stealing from the company. In other words, there, there was no integrity whatsoever. But how it should be said of a Christian in the community. You know, they're honest people. They work hard. Their testimony. I remember years ago when I worked uh, in a grocery store, employees would steal from the company. I thought, how sad and what a sad testimony. But it should be said of you as a citizen, as uh, wherever God has placed you on your job or whatever you are, that you have a testimony of integrity and honesty. And nowadays, people... They'll lie and cheat and steal at the drop of a hat. How important it is that you have a life as a testimony. Four ways. He said, in order that we should live a quiet and a peaceable and a godly and a life of honesty and integrity in our community. He said, well, look who's president. Well, look who's king under Paul. Nero. Why? Because there's a life that pleases God. Look in verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. In other words, he said there are two, two ways in which this is uh, right. First of all, it's good. It's good. In other words, the word good there is, is the word that implies it's pro proper or beautiful. Literally, Strong says, it's good in the eyes of God. It's interesting, there's two words, or really four words that Paul could have used here when he used the word good. He could have used the word agathos. Agathos means that it is good in its effect. In other words, you do something and it has a good result. That's not the word that he uses. The word he uses here is the word kalas. It means in inwardly good. Inwardly good. He uses it again. In fact, uh, in this uh, book, in chapter 5, in verse 10, when he says, it's well reported, of for good works. He uses it again in verse 25 of that same chapter. Likewise, also, the good works of some are manifest. He uses it again in chapter 6 and verse 18. And they that do good, that they may be rich in good works. In other words, what is he saying here? He's saying it's when you live this kind of life, and these four ways, that it is good in the eyes of God. In other words, it's not good that you do. It's good that God sees that this good work, that your life, that you're living, when you live this way, when you pray for authority, when you say, I'm going to live a quiet life, a peaceable life, a godly life, and an honest life, God said, that's good. Notice what else he says. It's acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. Again, he uses the thought, that phrase again in um, his book, chapter 5, when he talks about it's being good and acceptable. In other words, it's acceptable to God. You see, there are oftentimes things that we say that are good that may not be acceptable to God and may not be good to God. For instance, he uses the root word of this in First Thess Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Listen to what he says. For this cause... 
Also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men. In other words, the receive there is the implication is it was accepted. What's he saying to the church at Thessalonica is they received the word of God. Not like it was the word of men, but it was the word of God. In other words, they, they received it gladly. It's like when you have a guest that, that comes to your home and you receive them and, and you welcome them. Here's a seed and here's a place you're welcome. And he said that's the kind of attitude that the Thessalonians had toward the word of God. It was received well. And what Paul is saying here to you and I, when we live this kind of life, we may die like the Apostle Paul with our heads cut off in 2 Timothy when he said, my time of departure is at hand. But he said, listen, no matter what kind of a time and period, no matter who's president, no matter who's governor, live a life that's going to be good and acceptable and received of God. And what kind of life is that? It's a life that's quiet, peaceable, godly, and honest. That's what God wants from us in this day in which we live. And you know what? It's not dependent upon the flesh. It's not disrespectful. It's not disobedient. It's not ungodly. But it's a life like Daniel. It's a life like Joseph. It's a life like Paul. We can appeal to Caesar to change the law or to make it right, but we can be respectful to that authority. And we can pray Almighty God, as the Bible says, as hard as in, in the hands of God, and we can pray God to do wonderful things. He may or he may not. But you know what? We're not affected by the outward. We should allow the inward of that what does he say? Peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Let me ask you as we close. Our president needs our prayers. We need to pray that he'll be saved if he's not saved. We need to pray that he'll do the right thing. We need to pray for our senators and our congress. We need to pray for our governor and our mayor. We need to pray for our, what does he say? Those in authority. Young people, do you pray for your parents? Oh, they treat me unjust. Or, or maybe you had a godly parent or you don't have a godly parent. The Bible says to pray for him anyway. How about that boss? Maybe he treats you unjustly so. You need to pray for him. Pray for those in authority. Do you pray for your pastor? Do you pray for those in authority? The Bible says pray for them. We need to pray. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Lord, I come to you and I do pray at this time for our president. He needs the Lord. He needs God. He needs wisdom. He's the leader of our country. We may not agree with some of the things that he says and does. We may not agree with his policies. We may not agree with his personality or his policies, but we're to pray for him. And God, we lift him up to you. We pray for our senators, that many of them are uh, the two senators that we have are, 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 are pushing the wrong agenda sometimes, but we need to pray for them. We need to pray for our governor. We need to pray for those in authority. Sometimes authority may mistreat us. It may be apparent. It may be a boss. It may be even a pastor. But they always demand respect. And God, I pray that you would help us in these days. We need prayer more than ever before in this time in which we live. So help us, dear Father, we pray. We pray for our church. We pray for those in leadership positions. Lord, as we seek to open up our ministries in a greater way, as those in leadership that you would bless them and encourage them and help them. We ask, Lord, that you would help our, our, our time together today. May each of us search our own hearts. 
and be more of a prayer warrior. In Jesus' name, amen.